Hi there, this is your moderator, Lori Dearman, and you are in the right place for case study on how structured modality programs improve patient outcomes and operational metrics. I'd like to extend a warm welcome from Ventura, California to all of you as we begin today's webinar, sponsored by DJO Global and hosted by WebAttract, the leader in thought leadership webinars. In just a moment, I'll be introducing our panel of thought leaders as today's webinar is about hearing from these experts as they share data collected for more than 10 years of researching hundreds of communities to quantify the impact of modalities such as electrotherapy, ultrasound, diathermy, uh, diathermy use on function, functional and operational outcomes. Now we've invited you along with over 375 professionals um, representing 24 states and provinces all joining us today to learn how to implement evidence-based clinical programs with integrated electrophysical agents in a long-term care setting to improve patient outcomes, as well as functional and operational outcomes metrics to quantify your community's ROI, and how to implement an ideal modality program. Uh, that brings me to our first uh, interactive poll of today's session. If you wouldn't mind weighing in, we would love to know from each of you what are your top two challenges when it comes to modality programs? And in this case, you do have the ability to select more than two, but on the honor system, if you'd give us your top two, we'd certainly appreciate it. Uh, is it return on investment? It's not clear. Perhaps you have insufficient skilled training resources, maybe difficult to drive utilization, difficult to quantify impact on patient outcomes, or maybe it's something entirely different. 46% saying the ROI is not clear, 37% focus there on insufficient skilled training resources, 34% uh, saying difficult to drive utilization, front runner here 55% difficult to quantify the impact on patient outcomes, so I think today's information will be of particular interest and 11% weighing in with others. Other um, Janet saying uh, we utilize ESTIM but only have CPT code used is G-code assisted should be allowed to be billed. Um, so thank you again for that input there. And at this point, I would love to um, spend just a moment to introduce our featured speakers for today. They'll be passing the microphone back and forth between the two of them throughout. So I'd go, I'll go ahead and introduce them both right now. Uh, first up, we have Mark Besh. Mark holds a BS degree in biology and a certificate in physical therapy. He has extensive clinical and operational management experience in a variety of clinical settings, including acute care, skilled nursing, and home health. For the past 25 plus years, he has specialized in senior health and wellness and home care, long-term care, and senior housing settings. He's done numerous presentations on local, state, and national levels, is, an active, is active with multiple organizations for industry advocacy, as well as regulatory affairs. Mark, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you, Laurie. It's a, it's a pleasure being with you and, uh, and with the group today. Fantastic. And uh, I'm also very pleased to introduce Lynn Freeman. Lynn is VP of Clinical Research for Aegis Therapies and scientist for PATH Clinical Research Institute. Lynn earned a BS degree in physical therapy, a post-professional MS in health sciences, and a PhD in rehabilitation sciences. He's a board-certified geriatric clinical specialist and certified wound specialist. He's lectured over 106 professional presentations, both within the U.S. and internationally. His area of expertise include clinical program development, neurology, geriatrics, and wound management. Lynn, so great to have you with us as well. Welcome. Thank you, Lori, and it's an honor to be here and uh, an honor to be considered a thought leader. I'm not sure my family would agree. Uh, but uh, I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well, Lynn, um, why don't you go ahead and get us started with a few words on where we are in the post-acute world. Thank you. So I think it's, it's important to first start by explaining what we mean by post-acute care or defining it. So it's really defined as services furnished after an acute hospital stay, specifically those provided in skilled nursing facilities, uh, home health agencies, inpatient rehabilitation hospitals, and long-term acute care hospitals, or LTACs. Um, about 40 
two percent of all Medicare beneficiaries actually discharge into these settings, uh, and that's not even which is a pretty high number, uh, and that's not even including other um, uh, payers such as straight H HMO cases. Uh, so, what are some of the trends that we're seeing in post acute care as it relates to um, healthcare utilization um, and quality as it correlates? To do the you know what what are we seeing in terms of correlation between the two? Uh, the most significant is that over the past decade, there's been spending uh, that's uh, in these sectors that's doubled to about 59 billion from 2001 to 2012, and the growth is really being attributed to increased utilization again of all services um, in all sectors. But in a report that was published uh, earlier this year by Med MedPAC, they specifically document rapid growth in payments related to therapy services among. Um, the, the significant reasons for uh, this growth, and that's a little bit of a um, uh, slap on our hand, and we usually are, are had been the golden child way back when, um, so it's keeping us on our toes. The growth can also be attributed to um, the old sort of socialistic payment system, you know, in which the responsibility and choice of healthcare services really is more centralized, you know, managed by the government, managed by the provider, versus a more capitalistic uh, payment system which promotes consumer choice, so encourages the um, actual patient to seek services and encourages the provider to seek, um, or to have responsibility to provide services that are really more based on value. Um, what's most, so I talked about correlation, and what's most alarming, uh, if you will, uh, is that where there's an obvious growth in spending, uh, we unfortunately have not done uh, the best job of demonstrating um, uh, equivocal growth in clinical outcomes. Uh, and in fact, when reviewing the quality measures, um, there's been very little um, uh, improvement. So as of today, the need for reforms uh, in, this setting, in these settings is a pretty high priority. So how do we get here? Uh, it's really being attributed to the misalignment, if you will, of incentives um, and the payment system. So, for example, all of those various settings that I mentioned can treat uh, patients recovering from the same acute condition right after having been discharged from the hospital, that uh, patient populations that might present with a very similar risk stratification profile, and the outcomes might be very vastly different. So the outcomes uh, for the same profile of patients admitted to a SNF versus a LTAC versus a, um, um, an inpatient rehabilitation facility. Um, and the payments to the site that got the best outcomes are not necessarily aligned to reward them. Uh, in fact, they're neutral or even can be negative. So, and, and a good example is that there's a solid body of evidence that supports the use of electrical stimulation post-total knee replacement to not only promote long-term functional outcomes, more durable outcomes for that patient, but can also reduce the length of stay so that the patient can go home quicker. Um, however, if I, as a provider, choose to implement this for all the right reasons, um, I might inadvertently be penalized uh, financially because the short of length of stay. So the current pay payment system, like I mentioned, is very um, misaligned, and that's a, a major focus in terms of reform. So at this point, I'll turn it over to Mark, um, who will speak to where we have come from and, more importantly, where we're headed. All right. Well, thanks, Lynn. Um, just to uh, continue our, uh, our journey down this uh, historical compass, um, I want to spend just a moment to review uh, very quickly. Uh, obviously, most of you will, will recall, prior to the 90s, we were in a cost-based reimbursement model, so very much fee-for-service. Providers uh, did more or provided more service. Patients received more. Providers were paid based on services delivered. Uh, since then, uh, in the 90s, particularly particularly with the Balanced Budget Act in 97 and then PPS in the SNF world, at least for in 99, we've definitely shifted from that fee-for-service reimbursement to very much a prospective uh, re reimbursement model, where now the focus is based on patient need or patient resources, uh, if you will, and payment is based on delivered services or, again, on the resources uh, required for the delivery of those services. More importantly, let's begin to look ahead now. Where are we headed? 
certainly we are we we realize we are in an, in, an environment of increased scrutiny and uh, just a couple examples of that the manual medical review process that is in place for uh, part B therapy claims uh, exceeding that uh, certain threshold the uh, the program for evaluating payment patterns or the pepper reports uh, which are which are stated to uh, identify potentially uh, aberrant uh, billing practices definitely seeing the the evolution of more and more alternative payment methodologies right so the the evolution of accountable care organizations uh, the the concept of site neutral payments uh, which we know has been in uh, in the White House budget for for several years and uh, getting serious consideration from CMS in terms of what's what are they beginning to do now talk about comparing outcomes in different settings and then translating that to payment in different settings and wondering, gee, why is that? Why should that or, or should that be? And then obviously an evolution now of focusing on, on this generic term called value-based purchasing or pay for performance. We tend to use those terms um, interchangeably, but essentially a generic term that implies um, better quality, better outcomes, if you will, there will be incentive or an additional payments uh, attached to those. So in terms of evidence, we want to spend just a moment talking about trends that we're seeing in terms of evidence as, as uh, viewed by payers. So are payers requiring and depending more on evidence and we believe there's a number of indications certainly that there are uh, an obvious example is, is CMS uh, as a payer uh, in a number of recent uh, coverage determinations has cited specific evidence or in some cases the lack of, of specific evidence so definitely evidence-based medicine uh, clearly clearly uh, being focused more and more information coming forth now and examples of how incentives will be tied to quality. So this pay for performance concept, we see it in the, the SNF proposed rule, we see it in the Impact Act, and so there's no question that in, in the future, incentives and payment uh, will be tied to quality and to outcomes. We're also seeing research, what were typically research terms now applied more to payment and to quality. So terms like, uh, like uh, MDC or, or minimal detectable change, uh, essentially in the research world a measure of whether or not real change has occurred. Um, or, or terms like uh, MCID, the, the minimal clinically important difference. So if change has occurred, how much change is meaningful or is the change meaningful? So questions might be asked of a payer. So does um, a modality, uh, specific to our content here today, does a modality produce a clinically meaningful reduction in, uh, say, pain uh, in a particular population? population or does the modality uh, in, in produce a, a meaningful improvement in function uh, so this this concept of the application of these uh, what used to be more research related terms clinical trial related terms we're seeing more and more now applied to payment decisions so I think that's an important uh, evolution we're seeing as well so we're going to transition away from our historical compass now and look forward um, to, um, to our to, to more description of the program. And, uh, and Lynn is actually going to take that first step for us by talking about our modality program. Thank you, Mark. Um, as I mentioned earlier, and as Mark just uh, mentioned, the, some of the possible cost control strategies under consideration include expanding beneficiary and payer incentives to uh, be more value driven or select uh, treatments that are um, that are um, we know that are going to deliver a, a higher outcome and then as a patient select providers that are going to be delivering that those types of treatments so uh, as Mark mentioned now I'm going to share um, how we've used evidence supported modality programs to really create that value uh, through improved outcomes so this uh, slide really speaks to what 
I like to refer to as extrinsic validity. Um, so I'm going to here is I'm sharing an example of how we used evidence-based practice, and don't get confused because I'm going to talk about practice-based evidence here in just a few. Uh, but uh, evidence-based practice, which is the use of extrinsic evidence, you know, to drive clinical outcomes, specifically as defined by the late David Sackett. Um, everybody's probably familiar with with him, and uh, the term really speaks to the integration uh, of information from the best published evidence, right, as one arm, and then patient expectations as a very important second arm, and then also a third arm is the, clini the clinician's experience, you know, and so in, you, you use that approach in order to achieve the best possible outcomes for every single individual patient. And so to do this, what we've regularly done is to search for and then retrieve evidence on the use of electrophysical agents or modalities um, for diagnoses that are first uh, and, and most important um, commonly seen by us, so our high prevalence rates within our centers. Um, and then also, as a second priority, really that is is aligned with referral sources and what's important to payers and uh, and so forth and so on. So, for example, the high correlation between rehospitalizations and cardiopulmonary diseases like COPD, CHF, is really what drove the development of one of our uh, recent um, pathways that is uh, elect the use of electrical stimulation for COPD. And that was released to our field clinicians in, in well, I guess it's not recent. It was about five years ago. And so that's what you see here on the screen. It's um, a 2006 a study that was published in, in Chess Journal, um, and it was just one of several um, strong studies that was reviewed to develop this protocol. And you'll notice that the subject profile aligns. Um, you probably have about 10 or so of these uh, patients that look like this, if you will, in your facilities right now, but they align closely with the population that's commonly discharged within post-acute care uh, settings, so severely limited forced expiratory volume that results in the inability to actively engage in therapeutic right, uh, exercise. Um, and when that's the case, then the um, gains um, are usually insufficient you know, to produce meaningful for results for the patient and obviously you know, for, for uh, the payer. So without adjunctive therapies like electrical stimulation, many times the proportion of these patients are not candidates just because they simply can't tolerate high volumes of, of, of rehab. Um, and as you can see in this study, the group receiving ESTEM achieved a twofold improvement over the control uh, in physiological areas uh, such as muscle contraction, uh, dyspnea, as well as, and probably more importantly to the patient, right, functional and quality of life areas like ADLs and, and uh, uh, the ability to walk. Um, outcome instruments, right? So we have to make sure that what we're measuring really is what we're measuring. And that's, a, um, uh, as you no doubt know, um, the search for a standardized um, outcome instrument that will be applicable across all of these various uh, practice settings is difficult. Um, but it's important that in, we can't wait, right, until there's one developed that might take a bit. But um, we have to use something that we know to be valid and reliable. And for the past 10 to 15 years, Aegis has used um, the rehabilitation outcome measure um, as that tool. And it really was developed for use with a lower um, uh, functioning population, uh, specifically those in the SNF. And as you can see, it's, it uses a seven-point scale, very similar to the FEM, um, which is uh, used for more acute uh, patients. And also similar to the FEM, the ROM requires, as we do, um, certification um, before a practitioner can rate someone using that scale. And that's just really all about making sure that we can rely upon the results that, we, um, uh, that, that, that we're going to be speaking to today. And so the pro one of the primary differences, though, so those are all the things that are alike, but one of the primary things that are different um, is that the FEM is discipline-free. Um, and the ROM is discipline specific, and the whole point is that the population in terms of function and the variability is different. And so now I want to show, I want to speak to um, what we now refer, to, what I'm going to refer to as practice-based evidence. So I talked about evidence-based practice. So practice-based evidence really is just a contrast, sort of a play on word to Sackett's um, terminology, and it's what we employ, uh, especially those who 
engage in research activities or quality improvement activities in a more practice-based research network, right, like all of us um, on today's uh, call. And it's really all about when there is no published um, evidence available, which is unfortunately many times the case when it comes to post-acute care, then we have to look at what our own evidence is telling us, right? So we need to be looking at our own data to see what it's telling us about best practices and, and um, uh, uh, improvements and outcomes. So what we do is use the World Health Care Organization, so the WHO, their International Classification of Function to guide the development of these practice guidelines. So the figure that you see here shows an example of how we developed our electrical stimulation for a diabetes pathway, which was uh, released in, I think it was 2013. Uh, and again, this was, it's driven uh, by growth in the, the proportion of patients who have diabetes of associated conditions with diabetes, as well as the focus of the consumer. And so um, while we did not find a lot of high level um, analysis, like meta-analyses on the use of ESTEM for di diabetes, it's just lacking, right? What we did find was um, uh, some evidence to speak to its efficacy uh, in conditions like neuropathic pain and ambulation and wounds. And then we couple that, right, with our own evidence. And that's what we're going to speak with here, uh, speak to here on the next slide. So uh, you may be wondering, again, how do you collect this data? Where is it coming from? I know you use the ROM tool. Um, and so like most healthcare sectors. Everybody has moved toward electronic medical record systems, EMRs, right, to customize their uh, and make more efficient, quite frankly, the way that they uh, are able to document to their care. But those systems also usually have reports that can be customized to the programs and services that you provide. And so that's what we do. Um, so we use our therapy EMR to extract and analyze the practice patterns um, for um, the patients that are engaged in the modality program, and really we do, and we do this on a, on, a, on regular intervals, uh, and also at multiple levels within the organization. And the goal, um, again, is to audit compliance with the evidence-based protocols that we've put together, as well as to learn from what the data is telling us. So you can see that the table shows 2014 um, outcomes data for planned DCs. Uh, we exclude unplanned DCs just to not skew um, our findings. Um, I want to draw your uh, attention, though, to the first row, which shows outcomes for patients that received modalities, and then the second row are patients who did not receive modalities. And then now I want to draw your attention to the two highlighted bars. So here, admit and then gain. And so what's significant here is that you can see that the amount of gain or functional improvement that was made within the group that received modalities was about 16 to 20 percent higher than those uh, than the group that did not. And then probably even more uh, encouraging is that when you look at the ad admit score um, for uh, in terms of function, uh, in terms of the group that did not, they actually um, were higher functioning. So the group that, that received modalities were 27 percent more debilitated, if you will, yet and still the gains were 16 to 20 percent higher. And then you can look, you can see that when that's the entire population, but when you, we also analyze by general diagnostic groups and deficit areas. And so you can see when we look at wounds, 24% above um, those who received modalities, 24% gains that are better than those who did not. Um, uh, patients who have dementia, um, 18%, respiratory problems, 16%, orthopedic hip, uh, for, uh, uh, 13%. So consistently among the entire group, as well as uh, specific diagnostic groups, we see that modalities do enhance the outcome. And now I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Mark. All right. Well, thanks, Lynn. So we want to move now into uh, essentially building a business case uh, for a program uh, like this. So. Um, uh, we want to build a business case for this specialty modality program that brings technology and evidence to our practice because we want to we feel like we want to lead the way to innovation and not and not be followers so in this business case I'm going to focus on three primary categories those being regulatory uh, operations clinical operations and financial operations but before I do that let me just spend a 
few seconds talking about that term specialty. I called it a specialty modality program. So you see some examples here on the screen of how different organizations think in terms of specialty. Um, we just want you to be aware that to us uh, specialty practice means that we have established standards uh, which go above and beyond the basics. Standards for education, for knowledge, for experience, and for skills. So essentially what, what, we, uh, what we want to do with our program, which by the way we call, we call our program GEM, uh, Geriatric Enhanced Modalities. So you see that on the screen. So what our, our objective here is so that our outcomes are optimal or even superior. We want to be on the right hand side of this, uh, of this classic uh, 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 bell curve. So we, we want to we get uh, outcomes that are better than others and really be uh, uh, very, very high performers. So in terms of those three categories, first of all, regulatory operations. We, this program absolutely helps to optimize survey results. What do we mean by that is because the training provided helps therapists identify identify care, the programming, to be able to actively address those identified care needs. So um, very, very helpful in terms of survey uh, results um, that are focused on the identification and uh, the active treatment planning around identified needs. So you just see, and then uh, also improving quality. So we've talked about the emphasis on quality and definitely we see an impact on quality measures. So whether that's uh, continence related measures, skin care measures, uh, falls, another great example, uh, pain, obviously those are resonating uh, with many of you as, as quality measures and we can, you'll be able to, to track that, detect change, uh, on reports like you see here, the, the CASPER report. So we definitely see an impact uh, on those quality measures. Talking about clinical operations, uh, improved clinical outcomes based on comprehensive evidence-based procedures and protocol. As you saw, the data suggested that Lynn showed about 20%, 24%, the most recent numbers, uh, greater functional improvement with patients that have modalities as part of their treatment plans as opposed to patients who do not. Uh, it gives us a great ability to treat chronic conditions. The very first study that Lynn described that was published in Chest Magazine might not be the typical patient you'd think of that would benefit from electrical stim, but that study definitely improved that. Do patients have multiple conditions? Absolutely they do see some of the statistics here from the CDC in terms of numbers of patients that have multiple comorbidities. So by, by increasing by that functional gain that we reported and measure using the rehab outcome instrument clearly impacts patient, a decrease in patient impairment uh, and, uh, and functional limitation. So we spoke about the specialty programs bringing access to technology and state-of-the-art equipment, but access is one thing, but does it get used? That's an important part of program development and evaluation. So at one point in time in our program, we had access to the equipment, but we really felt like we could enhance utilization. And one of the ways that we did that is we enhanced the way we trained our therapists. Lynn is going to speak about this uh, in just a few minutes. And when we did that, when we made that shift that Lynn will describe for you, we saw a very significant change within just two or three months in utilization. So again, utilization being the, the number of patients that are benefiting from the program. We saw it increased um, slightly in some cases, dramatically uh, in other cases, sometimes uh, nearly doubling. Just a couple words on uh, financial operations. So what financially, what kinds of impacts have we seen? Um, definitely financial outcomes. I'll go through that in just a minute. But these other gains actually contribute to the financial outcomes. So we've talked about enhanced ability to treat more patients, whether it's across the continuum of service delivery or the multiple and, and varied chronic, more chronic conditions that we see. Treating more patients, 
equals more revenue, more impact. Um, both of those first two lead to improved and enhanced provider satisfaction. They're getting better patient outcomes and treating more patients, as well as obviously patient satisfaction. Patients' ability to, uh, to manage their needs increases with their functional gains leads to higher satisfactions. Therapists see this. Therapists know that their access to this equipment and their ability to, look, to deliver state-of-the-art technology is making an impact on their patients. They see it intuitively. They also can see it measured uh, based on our outcomes instrument. So all of those add up to what we find are just really enhanced marketing and differentiation opportunities for our partner facilities. And then lastly, I just want to walk you through a relatively simple ROI. So we just took one center, uh, sort of an average facility, 118 bed facility. We took the data very recently, so from Q, Q1 of this year. During that time, as you can see, we, we had 38 patients tr that were treated with modalities, and that calculated to about a 19% utilization. That's a very modest utilization, and we wanted to make this ROI conservative or modest, and so um, this facility made a, good, uh, made a good example. But again, it's, it's very real data. So what do we measure? We measure quantities. Um, of modalities, and we also, you see this other, other line called in incremental, what does that refer to? Um, modality revenue, is that related to the specific modalities, the stim, the diathermy, the ultrasound, and so forth. Um, for some patients, um, being a, being, having access to these modalities actually allows us to place the patient on caseload. It was a fundamental reason why we're treating those patients. So for those patients, and just those few patients, I think it was, it was three out of the 38, um, we actually count all of the uh, therapy uh, quantities, so the therapeutic exercise, gait training, and so forth. So for a very limited number of patients, we actually count the revenue from those quantities uh, as well. So you see the total in terms of, uh, of uh, revenue, and then we calculate the labor expense, our labor expense associated with the delivery of that care, and you come up with a net. So then to do the ROI, uh, we're going to assume here an equipment purchase cost of uh, $25,000. That's a, that's a pretty advanced suite of equipment. They don't, you don't have to spend that much. For the example, again, making it conservative on the ROI, we used uh, an upper end, if you will, in terms of the equipment purchase. Again, for purposes of the ROI here, the ROI, we amortize that over seven years, which comes out to a depreciation amount of about just short of $300 a month. If you look at the net then for the, the month and the quarter, you essentially end up with, with net revenue for the for the uh, for per month of four hundred and seventy six dollars, um, offset by that uh, depreciation expense, um, or about a six and a half percent return um, uh, 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 per month. Um, if you spent less on equipment, um, that number would go up. If you amortized it over a longer period of time, that number might go up. So so each of you will will no doubt have their own ways that you want to approach an ROI, but we just wanted to demonstrate here real quickly a one simple ROI. So in terms of, of a final summary slide, uh, for me at least, it's, it's we feel like the program, it absolutely impacts functional change in patients. Um, our data supports that, has for a number of years. You saw the data, our most recent data from 2014. So there's no doubt that having this program enhances functional gains in with the therapy that we deliver. Um, we think that spreads, uh, fits our strategic plan nicely in terms of being able to deliver services across uh, multiple locations, helps us establish uh, a differentiation factor. Uh, so I guess what, what we would sort of put out there for you all to think about is what's your differentiation factor, um, what's your competitive edge, uh, and would a program like this be something that would enhance that. So with that, we'll do one last transition back to Lynn, who will talk about uh, even more specifically our modality and training program. Thank you, Mark. So as Mark mentioned, um, you know, to this point, we've explained the why. 
from a clinical and operational perspective. Um, in the last section, um, we really want to briefly share the what and how. So here we'll talk about our perspective or share at least our perspective of what we found to, to be an ideal or make up, if you will, or comprise an ideal modality program for post-acute care settings, uh, specifically key elements, um, clinical support philosophy, if you will, um, that uh, we refer to as moving from cook to chef. All right, and so um, here, a little too far. Um, here are the key elements. So um, it's important to choose, and Mark spoke to this just a minute ago, it's important to choose program features uh, that work best for your particular practice. Uh, and that will include service options and equipment options, equipment and procurement options. So service options include what we refer to as full service programs that are either internally supported uh, by your own clinical staff um, or full service programs that are supported by out, outside clinical experts. Um, and it's important to clarify that in either approach, um, you don't, this doesn't mean you have to have this army uh, of people. You need to have the, what Mark spoke to, the not someone, right, as a part of your clinical support staff that has the expertise, so the knowledge and the skill. And they're able to translate that and, tra and, and um, uh, deliver training and support to the rest of the uh, team that has the, uh, 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 the program. So it's not much unlike specialty practice in other areas. So think about wound care in skilled nursing facilities uh, where you may not have a nurse or another clinician that is um, internally available. That's a, wound, that's a wound expert. So many times what do we do? We will hire an outside consultant to help support and the emphasis on help support. So the key is that they don't own it, um, but they help support. They bring that expertise. And then the procurement options. Um, the ones that we have found to be really critical to our package is, like many things, I have a variety of ways to acquire the equipment. Not everyone is going to be able to, one, option, purchase. Um, not everyone is going to want to, to rent. Um, and not everyone is going to want to rent to own as that third option. But it is, it is important to look for the having either of those options available. And then next is really deciding on the human and capital resources. And so again, I've spoke to, but I think it's worth stressing again that what, what we found to be one of the most critical elements to, um, uh, in our over eight years of experience in managing these programs is the human um, resource. Uh, we have consistently seen that without either externally managed support or internally managed support, it is difficult, if not impossible, to achieve the results that we um, have shared with you and, more importantly, be able to maintain them. And then the capital resources is just really trying to, and I'm going to speak more in detail here in, on the next two slides, but really to figure out what equipment procedures make the most sense uh, for your practice setting. So for example, for example, in inpatient rehabilitation facilities that might specialize in orthopedics, maybe a diathermy unit isn't the most, um, uh, the, the best choice. Maybe uh, because of the FDA listed limitations to using diathermy in the presence of metal, maybe laser might be a better choice. And then finally, the development. Um, and what we've found is that through the three phases of development, implementation, and then growth, and then sustainability, that on average, um, barring consistent staff and consistent clinical support, it takes about six to nine months to achieve and then um, sustain, get to that final level of being able to sustain those results. And then here briefly, I'm going to speak on these next two slides about one, um, looking for equipment that will uh, with technical advantages that will improve the clinician's efficiency of administering the procedure. So for instance, this figure demonstrates how equipment with onboard support, you know, either, you know, on the unit somehow or in the unit somehow, um, uh, dim, you know, will remind you, if you will, of electrode placement. Um, this one shows shoulder um, electrode placement. And then also procedural sequ sequencing. So I don't have to go run back and forth to a shelf to find out where the electrode should be placed or at least get guide, guidance about where they should be placed. And if 
I want to do three procedures within one, you know, first treat pain, then treat coordination, then treat weakness. I don't have to run back and forth to the piece of equipment. I can have that all be set up and delivered all at once. Um, likewise, efficacy. So we recommend looking for equipment with um, clinical advantages that will, uh, so I talked about technical advantages, and now I'm talking about clinical advantages that will help improve the effectiveness, so the efficacy of the, the procedure being delivered. Uh, so in this figure, it demonstrates um, how equipment with onboard FDA-cleared pathways will offer evidence-based dosimetry for the shoulder, uh, once again. So this feature really offers the novice clinician, who may not yet become the, quote, chef that I'm going to speak to here on the last slide, uh, assurance that this treatment will be effective. It may not be to the right side of that bell curve that Mark talked about just yet, and that's okay. Uh, but I know I'm not going to hurt the patient, and I know that I'm not going to, haunt, to, um, to, caught, to deliver an ineffective treatment. And then finally, we want to um, stress how important it is to establish a solid clinical support tra and training philosophy. And so as I mentioned, we coined this um, evolving from cook to chef. And it simply speaks to our aim to support the range of expertise of clinicians across all these various practice settings. So not just the expertise within the various practice settings, but remember, right, we're going to constantly have maybe the new clinician that has never used modalities or the clinician that um, needs to be introduced to the use of modalities. And so we need to be able to support those individuals at the cook, at the cook stage, right, which is often um, the case when, for new graduates, let's say, or occupational therapists who may have graduated from a program that has not yet integrated modalities into their curriculum. And all the way through to the chef um, uh, expert who needs more complexity, right, and they're ready to move to the next stage. So you can see from this feature, uh, uh, this uh, figure here that it's really important to um, understand the advantages of evolving to chef. So for instance, as it relates to rationale that you see there, the chef is able to explain and elaborate to the why they did what they did, and uh, that supports their modality procedures, the adjustments, et cetera. And while we haven't yet evaluated the trends or correlation between this training approach and maybe a reduction in denials, that'd be an interesting uh, analysis to perform, we do know that strong clinical documentation, that is, that is supported by and includes and demonstrates the use of skills, skill and knowledge, um, really does decrease uh, denials. So at this point, I'll go ahead and turn it back over to Lori. Well, thank you so much, Lynn. And um, folks, we are going to start taking some of the fantastic questions. But before we do, I wanted to give you just a couple of opportunities for next steps and ways to continue the conversation. You can see on the screen there. We invite you to request evidence on the clinical impact of modality use and review, uh, as well to learn more about how to implement a modalities program in your long-term community care. We'll give you some resources in a moment. Uh, also to speak with a clinical professional on how to implement an ideal modality program. And if you would like to request more information via email, uh, there is an email on the screen there, tina.voss at djoglobal.com. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, invite both of our speakers back to the virtual microphone. I'm going to start with you, Mark, with the first question, um, and that is, have you experienced any surveyors mentioning or even requesting the use of modalities, and if so, for which conditions? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, uh, thank you, Lori. You know, as I, as I think back, the comment, I think the short answer to the question is no, we really haven't. Uh, what we have experienced is surveyors who express appreciation um, for the presence of a program like this that gives therapists additional tools and approaches that they can use uh, in care planning for for resident needs that are identified. But I don't think we've had a surveyor specifically recommend um, a, uh, a modality um, for, uh, for any particular condition. Okay, thanks so much, Mark. And um, folks, I see about half of you having voted. I'll leave a poll up for just a little bit more before I close it. And I'm gonna take this next question over to you, Lynn. And the question is, how do you go about changing the mindset of your clinicians? when they don't want to use modalities 
perhaps because they don't believe in them? Uh, another excellent question. Uh, <laughs> we don't, we don't um, actually endeavor to try and change their mind, uh, but what we instead try and do is help them understand the whys. Uh, so we really uh, approach it from the perspective of no clinician doesn't want to do what they know is going to be effective. So we have found that training with the philosophy of understanding the parameters and the whys behind each of them really um, will move them to the point where they see the value and uh, begin to want to use them. Okay, thank you. Uh, folks, I'm going to go ahead and close that poll. It's like the majority of us having voted. And next question uh, directed to you, Lynn. Mark is asking, do I need a strong clinical management program to duplicate your results? Well, that's a, another really good question. Um, I, I would say, I would change the, the word strong. So I would say no, um, not strong in the perspective of um, uh, large or, you know, an army, but strong and solid expertise. So in other words, you could have one um, person um, in your entire organization that has knowledge, expertise, and, and, and uh, um, uh, probably more importantly is passion to train this information and be successful and be able uh, to duplicate these results. Okay. Okay, Lynn, I'm going to jump to our next question from Jim. Uh, he's asking, please, your thoughts regarding the tools designed to enhance and measure protocol compliance for in-home patient self-treatments. Do in-home patient self-treatments represent a threat to an office treatment professional or to office treatment professionals? Uh, really good question. Um, that's a uh, that's something that actually uh, I think a lot of vendors in terms of electronic um, uh, healthcare systems and communication tools are trying to put in place so that we can, uh, like telemedicine, right, and, and body-worn movement monitors so that we can be sure that the patient is complying with um, the treatments that have been uh, um, prescribed, you know, for them when they go home. Um, and so I, so right now one of the tools that we use or that's at least under um, development is a tool that might uh, be able to to offer you know sort of that extension of service uh, without necessarily having to have a person go and check up on them uh, um, physically I don't think that it op that it represents a threat I think that it um, through through really making sure that you are able to um, expand and diversify your services, I think that you can capture and um, be able to provide uh, those uh, uh, services when the person ultimately does need your services again. So by being able to stay connected um, uh, and help them maintain their function through the use of modalities and service provision while they're at home, when something else happens, then now you're able to bring them back into uh, your uh, system, if you will, um, to provide those. those um, okay. Uh, for you, Mark, Violet's asking, is the revenue based on what was billed to the payers or what you got from your revenue from the contract with clients? Oh, uh, a great question. Uh, thanks. Uh, the answer basically is the revenue that we showed on the screen came directly from the CMS um, CPT code published tables uh, specific to that facility in that state. So we left out the complexities of contract arrangements and such and, uh, and just built the ROI uh, from the uh, center perspective. Okay, perfect. Um, one more for you, Mark. Uh, Alberta is asking, in your presentation, you spoke about the financial benefit of the use of modalities. What do you think about the more recent shift of insurance companies decreasing payment or refusal of payment for some modalities? Wow, oh, great question, and uh, and one that's troubling, uh, troublesome to uh, to a lot of us. Um, I think that. Uh, so there's a couple of a couple of uh, levels, I guess, that, that we could uh, respond on that question. First of all, at, at the highest level, I, I think that um, I think that the the uh, 
organizations that are taking that position, whether it's limiting the amount of time that they're willing to pay for a particular code for a particular day, uh, or perhaps um, not even being willing to consider any payment uh, for, tic for particular codes. I think they're short-sighted. Um, we take the opportunity to challenge at every opportunity that we can, and we have been successful uh, in abating some of that activity with some of those organizations. We've experienced it across multiple uh, Medicare Max and across multiple uh, HMOs uh, to varying degrees. Um, so um, what do I think about it? I don't agree with it. Um, we challenge it whenever we can, um, either directly with the organization or through an appeals process. And um, we're pleased that we've been able to prevail in many uh, situations, but acknowledge that um, that it uh, it remains a challenge. So uh, I think that's the best I could do in terms of a response, Alberta, but it's a great question. Okay, thank you. Uh, Lynn, this one's for you from Russell. What do you do to improve your trainings to increase utilization of your modality program? Um, really good question. Uh, one of, the, I'd say the biggest change um, from in speaking to the sort of the, the slide that Mark showed um, that showed the improvement in, in utilization was moving from training to a protocol you know that may have um, a frequency suggestion right that is a single frequency suggestion uh, to one that is a range of frequency um, uh, for you know a specific condition based on evidence. So what that does is it prompts the clinician to ask the question, wait a minute, you didn't just tell me, you know, that the frequency should be 30. What is this 30 to 80 range? <laughs> How am I supposed to know? Um, and then they begin to understand, okay, so if the person isn't responding um, and, and, and I'm not seeing the strength gains at 30, I should move to 50 all the way up to 30. So it's really, once again, takes us back to that philosophy of, getting them to understand the why behind what they're doing. Okay, and this is, uh, I think, the last question we'll have time for today. It's over for you, Lynn. Uh, Claire is asking, how do you suggest we begin to approach our LTC coordinators to get individuals on caseload who may benefit from modalities? Uh, obviously, education, but how do we assure that we're getting individuals on board that will benefit from the modalities versus individuals that are flagging in chart review or on an MDS. Um, uh, a good question. In, ter in terms of uh, those who would benefit from a modality, it really begins with do they have, and the way we train is that do they have an indication um, for modalities, and those are, are all clearly spelled out. Mark mentioned some of them. So, for example, do they have pain? Do they have weakness? Do they and 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 uh, hopefully, as I'm saying these, you're thinking yes, yes, yes. Uh, do they have spasticity? You know, so is it is the impairments that they're presenting with? Thinking back to that international classification of function, are any of those present? Uh, and are any of those are any of those producing a reduction in function that um, will warrant therapy services? And if the answer is yes. To those two questions, then they they would qualify, and they would need you know our recommendations that they would be screened um, um, because if there's no contraindication to contrast that, then there's probably um, uh, uh, it, it probably they probably will be able to benefit. Okay, gentlemen, I think that's our last uh, audience question for today. I did want to give each of you an opportunity to leave our attendees with uh, any final comments. I'll go ahead and start with you, Mark. Okay. For, yes, absolutely. Well, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to spend a little bit of time with you today. Obviously, it's really difficult to uh, fully explain all of the aspects of, uh, of development of a program like we've talked about, but I hope the information has been helpful or at least given you a few things uh, to think about. Uh, one last thought I would leave you with is this, that if you decide to embark on a development 
development of a program like this or any program, really one of the most important things you can do is decide very, very early on what are, what are the measures, what are going to be the important outcomes that you want to be able to track and how will you measure those. Uh, because when you start looking back for effectiveness and, uh, and such, so critical to have those measures outlined uh, as to what they are and how you're going to measure them. Thank you, Mark. And how about you, Lynn? Um, I would just like to thank everyone for joining and um, uh, would uh, sort of echo what Mark mentioned, but speak to it from the perspective of um, really um, making sure that you have that you have support in place, clinical support in place. Once again, it doesn't have to be an army of individuals, but that you that you don't that you don't go out and purchase equipment and not have um, someone you know that can help oversee and manage the program, even if that is just one physical therapist that is as a part of your existing team that you know through and discussion with that individual that they uh, have a passion for training and they have the skills and knowledge to. Um, you know, to, to help support the, the success uh, of the program. The last thing that we want you to leave this call with is thinking, okay, all I need to do is go out and buy the equipment and I'm going to have 20% better gains. Uh, it really does boil down to, um, uh, in terms of achieving those, those outcomes, it boils down to uh, the training approach and, and all of the elements that we discussed. Okay, well thank you both gentlemen and folks uh, we are at that time, and I'd like to thank each of you for joining us today. Hope you found the webinar of value and that you'll want to join us for some future events. Special thanks to our guests, Mark Besh and Lynn Freeman, our sponsor today, DJO Global. And again, as your moderator, this is Lori Dearman saying thank you and have a great rest of the week. Bye for now.